It's an honor to be invited for this lecture, um, to be here in, uh, at this special university. Uh, I was thinking about what, you know, how has, um, how do I know UGA over the years? Um, I told some students earlier, uh, I studied ecology, so, you know, this is hallowed ground for ecology with uh, Eugene Odom, the father of ecosystem ecology, uh, cutting his teeth here publishing uh, the first textbook on ecology and going on to change the world. Um, so that's one. Um, two would be Michael Durr. Um, I spent about 25 years teaching woody plants at my university using his book. Uh, he's a UMass grad, by the way, so there's another UMass uh, UGA connection. Uh, Daryl Morrison uh, has, has been um, uh, an inspiration to me and many people over the years. Daryl um, is a really gifted um, writer, speaker, designer, and he really um, is one of, the, one of the people who have been dedicated to ecological um, landscape architecture uh, for decades. And, and I really respect him and, and find him inspiring. And Bruce. Uh, Bruce um, is one of the people who kind of brings a, a real uh, rigorous scholarship to landscape architecture. You know, Bruce uh, has put down uh, deep roots into working with uh, stormwater, from calculating stormwater to understanding how porous pavements work and, and really adding to the knowledge base of the field. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here in, in the company of people that I've known, people who I still know. And, and the people that I've met in this brief visit. So let me get started with the talk. Um, the talk is aimed for the students. Um, hopefully that will become clear as we go on. Start off with a few, kind of an overview of what I'll try to hit on today. Um, so talk a little bit about the, the new urban world. This is the century of the city idea. Perhaps you've, you've heard that phrase before. Um, the next big idea is resilience uh, in the context of sustainability, in the context of uh, this century. What, what does it mean? What does it mean to landscape architects in particular? And I will try to finish up with some examples from uh, practice, uh, not my practice, but projects and uh, initiatives that I have looked at around the world uh, over my career that try to illustrate and um, explain some of these ideas. So the new urban world, um, most of you probably know, sometime around 2007, the demographers of the world uh, reckoned that the world had become predominantly urban. 51% you know, of the world's population was urban. And uh, so that's pretty significant in the history of the world, by the way, the planet, uh, humanity. Uh, this is a big deal. This isn't just uh, a special event uh, last year or something. This is, this is profound. Um, and it's also, more importantly, it's not just a point in time, but it's a trend that's going to continue. Um, the greatest rural urban migration in human history is going on. Um, China is perhaps uh, the uh, poster child for that, where you know, many people intuitively think China is a very urban uh, country because of the, you know, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, uh, all these mega cities with you know, fives and tens of millions of people in them. But yet China is far less urban than the United States, but is catching up with us very quickly. And then this idea of the Anthropocene that um, I think is a provocative idea that the people are starting to become a geological force on a planetary scale. So let's um, look at those ideas a little more. This is, the, um, this is the graph of population. The red is urban, the blue is, uh, is rural, and the lines cross some, sometime around 2010. That's not so important as the trend and the projection out to 2050. So, you know, it's not, it wasn't a fluke, it wasn't an anomaly, we're on a, a trajectory headed this way, and, you know, that might not be so interesting, but if you all think about it, you students, 
uh, how long are you going to be working, right? You're going to be working 30 or 40 years uh, from when you graduate, uh, hopefully. And during that time, you're going to be working in, in this whole time. So the world is already urban, and the world is going to become much more urban over your careers, continuously so. So what does this mean? Is this just uh, a demographer's uh, uh, interest and, and uh, specialized interest, or, or does it have implications for you? I think it does. Here's another way to look at those graphics. You know, um, in 1900, the world was only 10% urban, and in 2050, it's going to be 75% urban. <clears throat> but uh, only 2% of the Earth's surface is occupied by cities currently. So that's a lot of people in small places, quite, um, quite concentrated and dense. <clears throat> and, but, um, you know, 53% of the world's population lives in 2% of the world's surface. So you get the message. Cities are dense. Cities are um, housing most of the people, and we're going to continue in that direction. For example, in China, this was a, a story from the New York Times uh, a little over a year ago. 250 million Chinese people are going to move to new cities in 12 years. Imagine that. You know, 250 million people is, I don't know, 70% of the population of the United States, the whole population, everything. Um, that number of people, you know, we have 300 million, 250 billion people are going to move to new cities in China in 12 years. How accurate is that? We don't know, but this is a, uh, a prediction and really has profound implications for everything from uh, food supply, energy, energy consumption, land use, but certainly landscape architects and planners are, are going to be involved in this. You know, it's good to see a lot of Chinese students here. You're going to go back with hopefully some good ideas from us uh, that will help you to do that. And, uh, but we're going to be learning increasingly from the Chinese because this, this is an unprecedented development in human history. It's never happened before and it's happening at, at an extremely rapid pace. So some people would, would look at this and um, you know, kind of shake their heads and, and think, oh, you know, this is, this is a disaster. This is, uh, you know, the end of the environment as we like it, as we know it. And uh, the future looks very grim, some would say. Other, others would say, you know, if you have an optimistic view, that uh, we have an opportunity now to make the cities better, greener, more sustainable, and more resilient. And you know, maybe it's uh, overly optimistic or naive to think that way. Personally, I, I, I find it an inspiring challenge and an essential challenge. The demographics are indisputable. We can argue over the shape of those curves and the actual dates, but the trend is unmistakable. It's happening. It's not going to change. I don't know anyone who would, who would argue with that. Uh, so we the future is going to be urban, and if the future is going to be sustainable, the cities have to be sustainable. It's a simple, logical connection, but has profound implications for urban planning, environmental planning. Um, <clears throat> so I think the, U the UN uh, has said it aptly. Um, you know, the millennium ecosystem assessment that was done on the occasion of the millennium change, uh, articulated millennium development goals, and came up with this you know, very powerful conclusion. The, these goals for you know, public health, income equity, um, shelter, all of the basic needs of humanity are going to be won or lost in cities. So kind of different versions of the same message. So I call it a a global wake-up call in an unprecedented challenge for landscape architects and planners. This is your, this is your life's work, right? Whether you're uh, involved in it more or less directly, uh, this is your life's work, and we have an opportunity to contribute to the, um, to the solution. So, sustainability. Um, I like to 
claim that there's a paradox in sustainability. The concept to many, maybe not all, to many implies uh, a search for some kind of an elusive, stable condition. You know, if we could only get it right, the world would be sustainable, many would think. You know, there's a, there is a solution to sustainability, some would, some would think. However, if we think long term, which is fundamental to sustainability, within any larger time frame, things are changing and there will be surprises and disturbances. Therefore, it's not possible to have a stable condition that will be, su that will be sustainable over time in the face of change. So, what do we do about that? So if, you know, I'm claiming there's a paradox, and how can one resolve that paradox? Well, you know, think about a little. This was, uh, when Bruce and I were in school, I, I think a lot of the thinking was more along these lines, you know, more like Diana, um, the Greek goddess of nature, that, you know, there's a balance of nature, that humans are intruders, what nature does is good, what people do is bad, and somehow out there there's this idea of a balance of nature. And this is what we should strive for. You know, getting it right, making good decisions, this whole idea of balance, as you can um, understand from my previous comment, is really uh, in opposition to the idea that uh, surprises and disturbance are gonna come. So, another Greek god, Pan, the Greek god of chaos and unpredictability, um, this is the, the counterpoint. This is the other perspective. That nature is not inherently uh, calm and stable, but nature is inherently full of surprises, change, and disturbance. And that humans are integral with, with this process. So we're living and working in a moving target, a changing game. You know, it's uncomfortable. It's, uh, it's more uh, reassuring to think about, you know, wouldn't it be nicer if we could all be happy and, and find the balance of nature? Uh, but, you know, think about anything, you know, pick up a newspaper any day, right? Today it's Ebola. Like, look what's happening with Ebola, you know? It's coming to the United States. It's, you know, it's moving across Europe. Uh, you know, who would have thought that a month or two ago? Um, we're coming up on the two-year anniversary of uh, Super, Superstorm Sandy that, you know, that whacked New York City with a direct hit and changed the game. Complete, changed the thinking, uh, you know, let's not even mention the, the, the cost, the physical, emotional, uh, social cost of that, you know, just the financial um, cost of that, and, and people's perception of the threat of extreme events. Um, Economics, right? What happened, what's happened so far this, uh, this millennium with economics, you know? This, this boat has been rocked severely a few times. So public health, economics, climate, um, just in a short decade, we can point to very specific and profound examples of change. So if we project out some decades, we better be prepared for things that we can't even imagine. And, and how, do, how does one do that? That's, uh, that's the great dilemma. So some would say, you know, those in the, who subscribe to this chaos theory would say that we're now in a non-equilibrium uh, world or, or paradigm. You know, it's not modern, it's postmodern. It's not rational and predictable, it's chaotic and uncertain. It's not hierarchical, it's panarchical, named after the god Pan. Um, Etc. You can you can get the idea. So, arguably, we're in a whole new paradigm of human knowledge in this postmodern world where we accept the idea that things are never going to be neat. We better get used to that, as um, Dennis Waitley says: expect the best, plan for the worst, and prepare to be surprised. So, that might be disquieting for professionals. Right? We're we're trying to solve problems and, and make things work. So. How does one engage with this challenge? You know, this urban world, this world that's uncertain, unpredictable, full of chaos, you know. What do you think, Lauren? Is there, is there any hope? I mean, <laughs> I, hope, I hope I can give you some points to that. So this is the idea of resilience, which I, 
I find to be um, a useful concept in this context. Resilience, the ability of systems to suffer or experience disturbance and change, but still retain of the fundamental state that they exist in. Uh, that's a nice idea. I find that resilience takes the, addresses the paradox of sustainability and puts the idea of sustainability into a larger context of time, right? Not this elusive, uh, stable condition, but rather this robust condition that can, you know, suffer disturbances and respond without collapsing. So that's a nice idea. Who, who can argue with that? I mean, who doesn't want to be resilient? I think the, the human immune system is one example of a resilient system. You know, if we're resilient, we're alive. If, if we're not resilient, we're not alive, you know. We all get confronted with all kinds of uh, microorganisms on a daily basis, and we're able to respond to those. So our, our body has developed a, um, an immune system that is an example, you know, in a biological sense of a resilient system. But how, you know, so that's a nice idea. How about applying that idea to cities, you know? Well, I don't know about that. That's, uh, that's what I'll, I'll speak about now, and I, I have thought about that. So I like this, um, this contrast of ideas from fail-safe to safe to fail. Fail-safe was arguably the mantra of the Cold War, you know, when I know Bruce is my age, so I'll, I'll pick on Bruce. When, when we were growing up, people were building bomb shelters. Um, you know, we were aiming mis nuclear missiles at each other by the thousands. Um, and there was this great belief that like, all right, we're going to win. We're going to beat the Russians. We're going to have really strong systems. There was a, a great faith in technology. You know, hey, we just, put a, we just put a guy on the moon. You know, we can do anything. So this was the fail-safe mentality, this great confidence and trust in technology and human knowledge to conquer nature and be in control of things. That was the fail-safe mentality. You know, that's the, in, in landscape architecture, we often call that the engineering mentality. I think that's outdated because engineers are now as progressive as anyone. Um, but back in the day, conservative engineers thought this way more concrete, more steel, we can engineer our way out of any problem. But in a resilience context, the uh, safe to fail idea is an intriguing one. Like, oh, you know, what if we experiment with some things in ways that can push knowledge and new ideas uh, without risking massive collapse of systems if they fail? Systems that are safe to fail because they are going to be challenged with um, all kinds of unexpected disturbance. <clears throat> so here's the, um, the classic diagram of a resilient system. This is from uh, Halling and Gunderson. It actually goes back to the 1970s. Not such a new idea. Uh, but this is a diagram of a, of a system that is resilient. I don't have a laser pointer, but up in the upper right is the phase of conservation. That's where, that's a stable condition. That's a, an old growth forest. That's a healthy, vibrant city. That's a cultural landscape that's been around for uh, centuries that is stable and functioning. And it can go on for centuries. But things happen. Uh, economic collapse, fires, uh, diseases, uh, earthquakes, floods, hurricane, you know, things come around and systems go into the uh, omega phase where they're kind of in a free fall and or a chaotic stage. And then if the system is resilient and on the right is called the, the for loop and on the back side is the back loop on, on the left side. And that's where the system, if it's resilient, can reorganize and recover maybe eventually coming back to a similar state. So it's a, it's a simple but a powerful diagram of systems that are resilient. And again, it's kind of, okay, those are dynamics, I get it, things happen, sometimes systems recover. The little arrow on the left there is kind of the exit point 
for systems that aren't resilient. They go into another state. They become something else. So I have an example for you, I think, that attempts to relate this to an urban environment. Um, Flint, Michigan, you know, the sister city for Detroit, right? In the upper right, you know, let's say that was, you know, 1970. Detroit was rolling the world, you know, uh, selling cars to everyone. Um, the future looked very bright. A great city was built with all of this revenue, all this technology. Um, you know, Motor City was, was alive and well. What happened? Oh, the Japanese uh, figured out how to make better cars, more reliable, less expensive, um, and the system collapsed. People stopped buying American cars. And the, and the city collapsed, and you know, it's arguably still in that stage. Flint, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, places around there, the wholesale abandonment of neighborhoods, uh, the city is in a free fall. So will that city recover and reinvent itself and come back into a prior condition of uh, an industrial center of power and success and uh, economic uh, vitality? Or will it go into something else? It's, a, it's, it's an attempt to explain in the context of a city what a resilient system would be like. And this one is still the jury is still out whether uh, Flint, Michigan, and Detroit will become resilient or not. So what can landscape architects do? You know, how, you know, if I've got your attention, you might be asking questions like this. Um, how can you prepare for what you, you don't know what to expect, you know? Who would have thought in 2006 that our economy was going to collapse, you know? Things were looking great. Who would have thought Ebola was coming? Hurricanes, tsunamis, uh, nuclear accidents. Uh, these are the things that are going to happen. How can you prepare for what you don't even, by definition, you can't define? Um, how do you build in the capacity to recover? The, the immune system is a nice example, but you know, that doesn't maybe translate exactly to a city. You know, it works. Human evolution has created this, antibodies and, and resistance, but uh, how do cities do that? Um, and how can you all deal with this in your work? You know, solving today's problems, but also building in the capacity to recover from unexpected disturbances. <clears throat> so I think it involves strategic thinking. And I think, I think this word is used a lot, but I don't think it's well understood. You know, the, ori the origin of the word is from military science. The dis distinction between strategies and tactics. Strategies is like thinking about your enemy and like how can I confront that enemy in conditions that are favorable to me. You know, that's a kind of a, a limited, but a, that's the military origin of the word. Uh, here's my definition. Um, systemic, proactive thinking and action aim to influence the drivers and causes of system behavior. Rather than the, the outcomes, you know, fixing a problem, putting a band-aid on things. Uh, some landscape architects do that, you know, green it up, you know, looks terrible, let's plant some trees and we'll be finished. Uh, I, that's not strategic thinking, that's tactical thinking. So I think strategic thinking is needed to, to understand systems and where they are in this cycle of sustainability and resilience, and then thinking about what type of interventions can contribute to the capacity to be resilient. <clears throat> so I've thought about this a bit, and, and I, I propose these five ideas. I don't know that these are the right ones. I don't know that these are the only ones, but I've proposed these five strategies as uh, the answer to that question. What, what can landscape architects do? How can you address um, res this really profound challenge for resilience? Um, and I've published it in this book with um, a couple of very enlightened engineers, by the way. Novotny is, a, is an engineer who um, thinks as creatively as anyone I know. So I'll go through these um, briefly, one by one. Uh, the first is biodiversity. I think we, <clears throat> we often think of biodiversity as um, 
maybe as an ethical responsibility. We, we should protect other species because uh, who are we to decide what species win and lose? You know, maybe it's a spiritual argument. Maybe it's uh, an ethical argument. I say let's, let's be practical and let's look at it from a, you know, an anthrocentric point of view. Like, what's in it for us? You know, how are we going to convince the world's cities, cities that biodiversity is important? You know, that's for, that's for out there. Uh, biodiversity doesn't happen in the city. Uh, the cities are where people and pavement and machines and pollution and cars and that's where that stuff is and we don't have room for the trees and, and the, the biodiversity. Um, well, I would say not. Um, you know, first of all, biodiversity supports uh, all of the ecosystem services that we depend on. The clean air we breathe, climate protection, the clothing we wear, the food we eat, the shelters that we live in. Virtually all of it comes from biodiversity in one form or another. So maybe that's a little bit abstract. Here's an interesting example from <clears throat> a, um, a really brilliant uh, biologist at, at UMass, uh, Derek Lovely, discovered this um, bacteria, Geobacter metalloreducens. He found it in the sediment of the Potomac River you know, some microscopic organism in, in, in a polluted river in the sediment. Like, really? If something good comes out of that? Uh, well, this critter has some really profound capabilities. It can uh, oxidize carbon dioxide using iron oxide in anaerobic conditions in, in sediment. It can destroy or mitigate petroleum contaminants in groundwater. That could be useful, right? How about that, you know? How, you know, what has bacteria done for you lately? Well, you know, sometimes it causes diseases. Uh, sometimes it makes your food um, get fuzzy and, and green. Uh, but sometimes bacteria can do things like this. They can metabolize and transform contaminants in groundwater. That could, become, that could come in handy. So it can also uh, produce methane that can maybe part, be a part of an so energy solution. And they're, they're, the frontier, they're working on those little green things on there. They're learning how to put those together in nanotechnology to make uh, micro bio uh, electro circuitry, you know, kind of like living computer idea. So this will come. You know, it's a few years away, but, you know, we're, we're heading in that direction. And it comes from bacteria. So just one example of how, what, what did I call it? Um, the latent potential of biodiversity to meet urban resilience challenges. You know, there's an example. Um, some cause for hope to remind us that biodiversity can be valuable in unexpected and unknown ways. And it might be prudent to, uh, to remember that and to, to use that. The second strategy, um, this comes to greenways. This is a greenway idea. Uh, the idea of networks and connectivity. Why is, why is connectivity important? Um, greenways become, they can become a kind of a buzzword, a, um, a flavor du jour, uh, the, um, the idea of the month um, concept, you know, so what, it's Greenway, that's, you know, that's so 1990s, you know. Uh, well, I, I did my PhD on Greenways to try to say, is there something here more than this kind of compelling, interesting idea. It's warm and fuzzy and green. And, uh, so what is, what is behind that? You know, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But there's an example on the top of the East German city of Leipzig that has a green ring, a, a network of green areas. Below is an example from um, a charrette that uh, Patrick Condon has done to try to visualize what sustainable cities might look like. And, and in both of them you can see green and connectivity. And why is, why is the connectivity important? Because it supports functions. We, well, I'll get to that in one moment. Um, it counters fragmentation. Fragmentation is a, is a problem because it disrupts certain processes and functions. Bruce's work reminds us that the hydrological system doesn't 
work well when we put it into pipes and fragment a natural drainage system. It doesn't perform the same way. It might convey the water quickly, but it doesn't provide the other functions. So connectivity um, is a second strategy. A third one is multifunctionality. In, in cities, space is always limited, so we can't afford to have a green area for biodiversity and nothing else. It always has to do double duty, triple duty, uh, more things in one place. We have to be efficient. Being efficient, um, we can do it in space or time. We can have things that have one function in the daytime, one at night, different seasons of the year, alternating seasons. So the same place, you know, in, in city space is always limited. It's kind of the definition of a city, right? We don't have a lot of elbow room. We have to learn to be efficient. And because it's a, you know, in a democratic world anyway, everyone has a right to advocate for their uses. People like bike trails. Some people like to drive. People, uh, some people care about water. Some people don't. So to make ideas that themselves will be sustainable by having them provide multiple functions, you build in a uh, constituency of support. You know? You get the bird watchers, you get the water quality people, you get the teachers who do environmental education, um, you get the people concerned about air quality. All of a sudden, a lot of people are arguing for the greenway or for the green network in the city. So that's another way to, to build the capacity into the city. Here's an example from Portland. I'm, I'm sure you all know about the, the leadership that Portland, Oregon has exercised in uh, in green streets and green infrastructure, you know, and I would say part of the success of that, it started for stormwater management, you know, trying to increase infiltration, reduce runoff, uh, but it does so much more than that. You know, the trees provide habitat for birds, they provide, um, they mitigate the climate, they mitigate the stormwater, they raise property values, they improve aesthetic value. So you add all those ideas up and you're starting to have a stronger argument for, um, for green areas in cities. Fourth strategy is redundancy and modularization. You could call this um, putting your eggs in different baskets instead of putting all your eggs in one basket. You know, centralized systems are fail-safe systems. You know? You have a centralized drainage system, a centralized uh, energy generation system. If that system breaks, phew, lights out for the whole city. The whole city floods. As opposed to a modular system, a neighborhood-based system, uh, a sub-watershed-based system, self-contained drainage systems, like this building, by the way. I've learned about this building that kind of takes care of its stormwater. You've got a big cistern, the water recirculates. Perfect example of that, you know. Kind of the rest of Athens can, can flood and, and run out of water and, and you've got your own little system right here, right? So it's a, it's a good example of that. Kind of modularizing uh, systems and redundant so that when one fails, the whole, it doesn't cascade through the whole system and cause uh, massive failure. Um, here's an example of this from uh, Berlin. Kind of another version of what you've done here, but this one includes um, surface uh, water bodies with plants. So the water you see there has been collected from the build. This is in the mid right in the middle of, of Berlin uh, after reunification, the, the old center, city center that became the city center once again. And when they developed it, they, tr they were progressive and they were thinking, making it a green development. Potsdamer Platz, if you want to look it up. Um, so this has a system that, uh, that collects the storm water from all the roofs, all the pavement, all the roadways, uh, puts it into basins where it is also moved into subsurface cisterns and recirculated for gray water use inside the building. So this, this uh, aquatic area with plants on it that, by the way, is built on top of a parking garage, uh, can provide these, it's aesthetically attractive, Big name companies are there. It helps their corporate identity. Sony, uh, Daimler, Benz, and, and so forth are there. Um, but it also helps to clean the water. Uh, it looks beautiful. There's wildlife there. And it's also part of a system that can circulate and use water in a more uh, modular and redundant way. 
Another example of this is um, a new park, in Am relatively new park in Amsterdam. It's about eight or ten years old now, uh, a Brownfield Park. Kind of uh, a new version of uh, Gasworks Park in Seattle from the 1970s uh, by Richard Haig, if you know that project. Same kind of industrial use uh, and was converted. Now there's newer ideas, uh, more advanced water treatment. So this marsh and, and uh, weir system is part of the water, uh, the stormwater um, remediation and circulation system. The water is it moves by gravity to the bottom, then it's pumped back to the top and recirculated. So, and it's, se it's separated from the uh, contaminated soil below. So again, this idea of a self-contained uh, modular system that is safe to fail and uh, won't spread disturbance to other areas. The last strategy is um, adaptive design and safe to fail design experiments. You know, you students, you, you might say, you might understandably ask your professors like, okay, I get it, you know, how do we do this? And the answer is, well, we don't, we don't really know. Uh, we're, we're learning as we go. Uh, we're figuring it out on the fly, and, it's, it, that, and that's not gonna change, right? If we're in this chaotic world, uh, we're always going to have uh, disturbances and unexpected changes that we can't possibly anticipate. So it's really about, um, keeping the knowledge advancing in parallel with the environment and the new challenges that are going to emerge. We have to have a culture of experimentation. Arguably, the design uh, professions are conservative. We can be a little gun shy about taking risks because we can get sued, right? So we go to the reference on the shelf and this, this is how we do it, right? Here's my, there's my drainage calculations. You can't sue me on that. I use the standard calculations. But guess what? The standard calculations have got us into the mess that we're in now. So we need to try something different. We can't just throw the book out, but we can say, oh, what if we change something a little bit? What would happen with that? Um, so I call that a, a culture of innovation versus a culture of conservative professionalism. You know? The conservative professionalism got us where we are now. We need a culture of in, uh, innovation. And, and make a habit of monitoring. You know, I've, in much of my academic career, I've been looking at what professionals do and asking questions. Oh, you're doing stormwater infiltration. Oh, how's that working? Well, we don't know. We, we didn't have any money to, mo any money to monitor it. Um, oh, you're creating, you're trying, you think you're improving water quality. Do you have any data? No, we don't know how to do that. Um, so we have, at the very least, we, we dismiss it casually. At worst, we um, don't want to do it because we might, we might show that it didn't work, right? So I don't want to monitor it. It might show that we, we didn't achieve our results. So this is where we are, you know, and I think this beginnings of some changes in this culture uh, some of the uh, green certification systems like LEED and sustainable sites are starting to uh, require monitoring. You know, LEED initially had no monitoring. You know, we're going to save energy. We're going to, people are going to be more productive. Well, did you look at that? Well, no. Um, so sustainable sites is starting to do that. And I think the more will be coming. And I believe it's a, it's a change in culture, professional culture, being willing to take risks, not reckless risks, but safe to fail risks, trying some new ideas, because in addition to the possibility to fail, you can succeed. And something good can happen, um, like this simple example in Seattle, um, the C Street. You know, you know I, I, when I finally got to see this, I'm like, really? That's the, that's the project that rocked the world? That, that's the C Street? Uh, well, yeah. It's, uh, the city of Seattle was confronted with a, a new problem. The Environmental Protection Agency said, um, guess what Seattle, you, you have endangered species that live in your city, uh, salmon. Several species of salmon live in the city of Seattle or could live there. So guess what, you're subject to the Endangered Species Act, city of Seattle, what are you gonna do about it? So, the, they didn't go to the landscape architects, sorry. They went to the public utilities agency and said, we need a new 
a new idea. We need a new vision. So they said, okay, let's, let's think like a salmon. And they, what does salmon need? Well, they, not a lot. <laughs> they want clean water. They want a stable supply of water. And they want cool water. You know, three things that conventional stormwater drainage doesn't do, right? It flushes it through, it's hot, it's polluted. So that means you have to get the water into the soil, moving through the groundwater to discharge into the stream, thinking like a salmon. So they said, well, how, how do we do that in, in a typical neighborhood? So they went to a, you know, not the most urban part of Seattle, admittedly, but they said, let's change this street, this typical uh, suburban type neighborhood Let's narrow the street. Let's put drainage swales on both sides of the street. Introduce native plants. And let's see what happens. Simple idea. Um, and they monitored it. They had engineers to monitor it. So they looked at the flow. They looked at the water quality. And it was a huge success. 98% of the wet weather and 100% of the dry weather was eliminated. So it works. Um, they also realized other benefits that they weren't really planning, like traffic calming. You know, maybe we would expect that, but it really worked. Um, increased social interaction. People in the neighborhood were engaged in um, selecting the plants. They waited until they had complete buy-in by everyone on the street. You know, we're going to plant native plants. This is why. Uh, what do you want? So they let the people ch uh, choose the plants. And, and now the people go out there and help to weed the plants, and they're engaged, and then they meet and, and speak with one another, um, and so forth. So, and then and th this idea, this little experiment, was the first pilot. Um, if you want to see green infrastructure in action, you know, that's proliferated across many parts of the city, go to Seattle. And they've, they said, oh, what happens when, with this idea on a steep slope? Oh, so they tried that. They made a set of, of step weirs coming down a hill. What happens if you do it in a more urban environment? They're doing it in downtown Seattle now. So, <laughs> and they keep with this attitude that I would say is a, a perfect example of um, safe to fail and learning by doing. So those are the, those are the five strategies that, that I put out there for discussion. You know, I'm not saying these are the ultimate, the only ones, the best ones, but I think it's, uh, it's my attempt to say, well, you know, this, this really um, big headache you might get if you think about resilience and like, oh my God, we're doomed. What, what are we going to do? All these people in cities, the cities are vulnerable to climate change, flooding, all this stuff. Uh, how can you possibly do it? Well, I'm trying to help people to think about that and especially landscape architects to, to think strategically uh, along these lines. <clears throat> So now I'll give you some examples of some projects that, that I feel implement and demonstrate some of these ideas. I've been, in my travels, I, I always look for best practices and exemplary projects. And I found a few in my travels. Um, Hammerby is, I think, the best example I've seen of a, a pilot sustainable community. It's built on a brownfield. Um, <coughs> pretty substantial in size. It'll have 25,000 people when it's completed. It was originally part of um, an Olympic bid that was unsuccessful, but the Swedes decided to go ahead and, and build it anyway. And it kind of does everything as illustrated in this, uh, this model called the Hammerby model. Integrated, renewable, circular, energy, water, and waste flows. You know. So the waste, for example, they have these uh, vacuum tubes throughout, throughout the community. You can put combustibles, organic, uh, recyclable, and then the real trash. There's four tubes. They're uh, pneumatic uh, suction. So they don't have to have trucks driving through the neighborhood. So you put your organic waste in there. It goes to a methane digester. It, gen it composts the organic waste and gives methane back that's used in, in the houses for heating and cooking, as an example. Also solar energy, also uh, geothermal energy. Um, kind of all of the tricks in the, of the tool are kind of applied here. <coughs> and with, with a, I think, a powerful conceptual model. It's a beautiful 
urban environment, I, I would say, with a high level of amenity and uh, a lot of attention to public open space. And, um, you know, Bruce would appreciate, have you seen this one? Not personally, Okay. No. Um, you know, I think it's a really nice example of how designers can take the idea of, you know, the open surface drainage concept and not just to do it in a plumbing sense, but to do it in an aesthetic sense in a nice designed way. So they've taken opportunity to integrate all of these drainage features, including you know, a beautiful canal in the middle of it. So the whole community is really built around water. And, uh, and then after it goes through all this collection and bioremediation, it's discharged into the lake um, in a relatively clean condition. So nice example, um, here's a, a stormwater biofilter where some of the stormwater is, is uh, delivered to the top bed through a different uh, a, a sequence of um, basins with different types of plants that remove uh, nitrates and phosphates and um, biological contamination from the water. And it's arguably nice to look at. And and then this water system becomes a part of the community identity, pedestrian corridors, make it accessible people, so people can see it. Um, you know, people need to enjoy these things. It's not all about cleaning the water and protecting from floods. Life should be fun. Places should be beautiful and inspiring. <clears throat> Another good example that I like is uh, in New York City, in Staten Island, the Staten Island Blue Belt. This has been written up in LAM and, and other places. Um, I find it to be a really fine example of green infrastructure in, in practice. Staten Island, as you may know, is um, the least densely populated part of New York City. It's one of the five boroughs. You know, you have to go across a big bridge or take a ferry to get there. Um, and it was the last to be developed. And it really started being developed after the Verrazano Narrows Bridge was built in around 1970. Big flood of development. And it's a low coastal plain environment uh, that had a lot of flooding problems. And they didn't have a conventional drainage infrastructure in place. So Dana Gum, the planner who had been a student of Ian McCarg, said, wait a minute, let's not repeat the old system. Let's try something new. So they, he created this blue belt idea. And this is a system uh, that collects the water from neighborhoods with conventional drainage. But before it's discharged into streams and ponds, it's passed through a created wetland system. That's the simple concept. Created wetlands that are placed in between a, uh, a drainage network and a discharge into a stream. And that's what it looks like up on the top. So it's kind of, it does use the, na the, um, the native uh, drainage system, but the water is pretreated before it's discharged. There's a diagram of it. It's a kind of a, a, a simple, uh, the tools are very common in stormwater management. Four bay, constructed wetlands, micro pool. So the water comes out of the neighborhood into a four bay where the velocity drops, the sediment comes out. That's where the, the sediment can be cleaned out. Then it goes through a little channel where it's aerated, passing over rocks. And then it goes to a, a pool where it is stored um, as a kind of a reservoir with some capacity uh, for flood storage. That's what the micro pool looks like. And remember, this is all uh, human created. It was not kind of imposed upon an existing wetland. This is a, a new wetland. They've used um, a very ambitious program to salvage native plants from development sites. So they use locally sourced native plants for this. All native plants throughout. And it works. And by the way, they saved $50 million for the city of New York versus a conventional system. So ah, that, gets, that gets people's attention. And now this idea is being adapted. The same idea, you can't put this in Manhattan. There isn't enough room to do it. There's not enough space to make new wetlands uh, in Queens and Brooklyn and, and the Bronx and so forth. So now they're saying, well, we could, there, maybe there are places we could put this in some of the uh, waste areas around uh, highways 
um, some park areas where the parks might not be uh, so intensively used. So the concept is being adapted to other parts of New York City um, and it's part of their long-term greening plans. And one time when I talked about this, somebody asked me, well, what happened to this thing uh, after Hurricane Sandy? Because this was pretty much a direct hit. You know, this is right on the, the coast. You know, this is out there. It is New York Harbor, but this got a direct hit from Hurricane Sandy with the 20 foot storm surge where, you know, the houses were just demolished. And so there's two satellite views and basically it survived, you know. The boardwalk at the bottom on the top photograph is gone, but the system worked. Uh, there was some damage, of course, but so it's kind of a resilient system, you know, a decentralized system, safe to fail system. And because it's uh, a biologically based system, you know, even these plants here that, that look kind of beat up can recover. The root systems are alive, they can respond and adapt to that condition. Okay, um, a few words about greenways, which I, um, I mentioned. I, I did a PhD on this to try and articulate some theory about is there something more than just um, a word that's inherently appealing. So these are networks, multiple purpose, and they support the concept of sustainability. That's my definition. Um, I argued that there were three, three big ideas behind this that um, answer the question, you know, what's this with greenways? Do they really do anything substantial? Uh, one is the hypothesis of co-occurrence of resources. Two, the inherent benefits of connectivity. And three, the compatibility of multiple use. So if all of these are true or valid, uh, they start to support this concept as more than just um, a nice uh, popular fad. So here's some uh, pioneering work by a, a famous landscape architect, Phil Lewis, uh, in the state of Wisconsin on this idea of the co-occurrence of resources. Phil Lewis was doing a, a statewide uh, recreation plan. Uh, pretty interesting story. He, um, he was a kind of an energetic guy. Um, and he, he said, well, we're gonna, uh, he got a gymnasium and he covered the gymnasium floor with uh, USGS quad maps for the whole state of Wisconsin. And then he had people walking around with different colored pins. Where are the historic cemeteries? Where are the uh, campgrounds? Where are the historic um, schoolhouses, uh, pristine wetlands, wa uh, fragile wildlife habitats? 300 different resources they mapped statewide, and they found that 90% of them are located in corridors. It's not a coincidence. People live near rivers, people use rivers, or uh, it's basically rivers and ridge lines are the key here in this landscape. You know, the ridge lines are the high areas protected from flood, good transportation. The rivers are the source of water, also transportation, moving things. So it's not really a surprise that resources and, and human cultural resources are located there. So therefore, if you protect the corridors, you're protecting places with inherently high value and a concentration of resources. So that's why we protect greenways. There's, there's a reason, right? If this hypothesis is valid. Um, the benefits of connectivity, because connectivity supports uh, certain processes that don't function when they're not connected, like hydrological processes, like wildlife movement, and like human recreation. They require and benefit from connectivity. And we take connectivity for granted in many facets of modern life. You know, you don't wonder if, you know, this road out here uh, will get you to Atlanta, right? No, of course it does. We, we assume and we expect certain parts of our uh, world to be connected. Then we say, you know, gee, could I call you with my phone? You know, would my phone connect to you? Could I call my, my mother-in-law in Texas? Or, you know, connectivity is, you know, that's the essence of communication. Communication, transportation, energy distribution, um, organizational structure has connections, reporting lines. So in many facets of life, we, 
we have completely accepted the concept of connectivity, but we're still learning that concept in landscape connectivity. Like, what do you mean? Why does it have to be connected? I don't, you know, I don't, I don't get it. Because the functions that depend on connectivity won't, won't operate if in the system isn't connected. For example, um, wildlife movement. Some interesting research in Australia. They put some radio collars on koala bears and, and followed them around for a month and so, to see where, where do they go at night and where do they go day after day. So if you look at the dots, those are recordings of where the koala bears were and that's superimposed on a map of green areas around the city of, uh, in Victoria, Australia. So, and you can see, yeah, the koala, you know, if you build it, they will come. If you make a green network, the koala bears, in this case, will use it. And there's lots of examples of that in landscape ecology. So the, the third argument for greenways is this uh, presumed compatibility of multiple use. This is a challenge for designers, right? It's not inherently, it doesn't just inherently work, but with good creative design, respect for different types of activities, you can have a bike trail that goes near uh, sensitive wildlife habitat, right? You, have, you might have to manage it, you might have to use fencing, sometimes you might have to restrict access for a certain period of the year. Uh, but there is a possibility to plan and design so that you can get more uses out of a certain place and then you're building this constituency of support. Like I said before, you get the, the bird watchers like it, the bike riders like it, the, uh, the baby walkers like it, the uh, senior citizens like it. Um, everybody can like it for different reasons, but you end up with a big coalition that says the Greenway is a good idea. Here's, a, here's an example from Florida, an eco duct, you know, an overpass for wildlife across the highway. You know, this is the answer, how does the chicken get across the road? Um, well, he needs an eco duct, or you know, you, you know what happens if you don't have an eco duct. Uh, but the eco duct can also be for other, you know, this one is also for horse riders, bicycles, and hikers. So you get a lot of people that say, that's a good idea. This part of Florida is pretty big horse country, so that was a big deal to be able to allow uh, equestrian use of that. <coughs> An example from uh, Germany, the um, Emscher Park. I call it a greenway. Um, may, they don't call it a greenway. But this is, uh, the Emscher is a post-industrial region um, in the Ruhr area of Germany, in um, western Germany, <coughs> that was um, really down and out um, at the time this program started because uh, it used to have an economy based on coal mining and steel manufacturing. They stopped mining the coal because it was dirty and inefficient and kind of mined out. And the, uh, the Chinese kind of figured out how to make steel just as good for cheaper. So the steel industry collapsed. So the place was in, in real demise. The Germans have this great tradition of IBAs, International Building Exhibitions, kind of an architectural experiment. They're usually done for a year. This one was done for a decade. And now it's going on three decades. And it, they took on a whole watershed. Uh, this, I think there's a couple million people living there. Um, the ultimate brownfield in, in the heart of Western Europe. Lots of green infrastructure. And what's really important is that they, they, they took a, what was then a radical idea that the industrial heritage is not something to be forgotten, erased, and replaced with shiny, clean, new stuff, but it was rather to be celebrated and integrated and to become a part of the identity and the heritage and the culture of the region. You know, it's beautiful. Old, rusty factories are beautiful. It's kind of the, 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 the big idea. Um, they also invented a whole new concept of industrial tourism. Yes, people actually go there to look at these old factories. Some of them have um, theaters in them. Christo did an exhibition in one of them. Um, they're, they're just fantastic places that are really unique. You know, everybody's been to a concert hall, but you haven't been to one inside a gigantic factory that's about, you know, 10 times the size of this building. Um, monumental in scale. But the industrial uh, heritage left uh, a really legacy of really severe pollution and contamination. You know, 
the, the water was, uh, the, the ground was so perforated with coal mines, they couldn't put pi sewer pipes underground because they would just, they would collapse. So they had to put all this sewerage for a million or so people on the surface. So there's like raw sewerage draining. This is, this is what they started with. Um, they've since learned how to make underground systems for, for sanitary sewers. Uh, they've restored the river now from a, a literally an open sewer into a, um, a more viable river. And some of these old, really heavy industrial facilities have been converted into really unusual, really unique, really beautiful um, recreation areas, cultural areas. <coughs> Succession has been allowed to occur, you know, kind of spontaneous greening of um, opportunistic urban plants. Um, there's been some nice design work here. Uh, Peter Latz, most notably a great German landscape architect, uh, gets credit for some of the more important work, but also some great environmental artists like uh, Richard Serra have done work that's on display here. So really kind of a, a big deliberate attempt to bring art and culture into this landscape, dealing with the environmental problems, making, using connectivity, the whole, when the rivers have been restored, they're integrated with bike trails. So it's always a multifunctional, multi-purpose place. You may have seen um, this project before. This is the, kind of the signature project of, uh, of Peter Latz here. It's called Piazza Metallica. This was where the, um, in the middle of the blast furnace where they made steel. And the steel was fabricated into these giant slabs. They're like a foot thick and six feet square. Uh, you know, big, you know, this is making steel for, you know, railroads and, you know, big time steel production. So he, he took these out and this is a, a theater and performance space, you know, that is definitely celebrating the industrial heritage of the area. Some of the features here have been adapted for uh, recreation, for climbing. That's a cool idea. Um, and the, uh, on a broader scale, the landform has been terraced and um, sculpted in a very creative way. So I think it's a, it's a fine example uh, on a very big scale of Greenway thinking. Um, it's, you know, it's not about just kind of scrubbing and cleaning things up and replacing them. It's about working with adaptive processes to, yes, to regreen it, but to also invent uh, an economy that works. You know, these people didn't have much to do. Uh, now there's starting to be a new kind of a tourism industry. So, so go there and, and drop some euros and um, you'll love the place. It's, not, it's like anything else I've seen in the world. You know, these old railroad yards that have been, you know, these aren't planted birches, these are spontaneous trees. But the juxtaposition of this heavy industrial heritage and this robust spontaneous vegetation is, um, it's really moving and inspiring. You know, it's like what the High Line was supposed to do <laughs> before it was kind of scrubbed clean and replaced to look like it was native. You know, this, this is the real deal. And um, monumental scale in, in the structures. Okay, back to New York for a quick example. Um, Harlem River Park, uh, New York City Parks Department has done some really innovative work to try and green their waterfronts and to make them more biodiverse. So this is about uh, putting biodiversity in the city. Uh, there's a conventional urban waterfront on the right, steel and concrete bulkheads, no place for living uh, organisms, not very interesting to look at. Here, the bottom is the new, a new park. Admittedly, it's a pilot project. It's not miles of this, but it demonstrates the proof of concept that um, you don't need to have those bulkheads. You can create an environment that will be biodiverse and integrating some um, opportunities for environmental education, like this tide pool, and applying some, some innovative construction techniques. Um, you know, this is salt water. This is brackish river. Uh, so these are gabions, but they're stainless steel gabions because the idea of the gabion was essential to get something that could provide habitat for oysters. Uh, you know, you can't do that with, uh, with a concrete wall. 
has to be porous, you know, let the tide come in and out. Uh, and regular gabions wouldn't last too long in salt water. So they developed some new, new te construction techniques to make this work. And the oysters are just a nice example, uh, another example of biodiversity at work in the city. They're cleaning the water. These are not to be eaten oysters, um, but you know, they, they drink in polluted water and they uh, expel cleaner water. You know, God bless them, they, they sacrifice their bodies to clean the water, and um, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, that's a, putting biodiversity to work for people. So that's the park. Um, I'm almost finished, just a couple more words here. Um, the concept of transdisciplinarity, I find to be not well understood, and, but very relevant uh, in this whole discussion. This is about how we work. You know, here I am talking to the choir, right? The, you know, landscape architects and planners and maybe some historic preservation people, but, you know, we don't have economists in the room, right? We don't have political scientists. We don't have um, geographers. We don't have um, engineers. And we don't have the people of Athens here, most importantly. So transdisciplinarity is uh, not a buzzword. Um, it's been defined here by uh, Tress, Tress and Fry, and it's illustrated in the bottom diagram. The top is a disciplinary approach. Disciplines work independently on projects, never, never communicating. Um, interdisciplinary is maybe the state of the art now for most work, right? You have a lot of disciplines working on things, contributing to a common solution. Not bad, that's a big improvement. But transdisciplinary disciplinarity brings in the stakeholders and decision makers, not only as um, consumers of the information, like here's your results, I hope you like it, but invited at the beginning, like what do you know about this project? How can, how can we learn from you before we get to work? So initially and continuously, information flows both ways. And if we kind of embrace the idea that sustainability has a big social component, uh, you know, we need to engage the people. And, you know, design professionals are involved in projects for a really short period of time. I hope you like your new park. Well, you know, who's going to take care of this park for decades and centuries? Maybe if the people who are going to use the park are involved in planning, designing, uh, all of the details of the park, they're more likely to support the park. Oh, don't change that. That's there because they'll remember things and they'll contribute to a better solution. So a lot of people think that transdisciplinarity is not a buzzword and is the modus operandi for sustainability planning. If we're going to claim to be really sustainable, we need to do more than lip service to public participation and input. And good, okay. Um, so I'll finish with kind of reviewing just real briefly some of the ideas. So we are undeniably, um, inarguably in the century of the city, uh, and that's a trend that's gonna continue for you know, most of the audience, for, for your professional, the rest of your professional career. The whole thing, this is, this is the game that you're in. And, and everybody else in the planet is in it as well, you know. 70% of the people are gonna be in cities um, by the time you retire. Um, things might level off then, we'll, we'll have to wait and see what, what the projections are. So this is a new reality, it's a different reality, and has profound changes. Uh, many people, the United Nations, myself, um, a lot of ecologists, ecology is now you know, every day there's more ecologists coming to urban ecology. It's like the big deal in ecology now. I've been involved with ecologists for a long time and there's a huge interest in cities. Be 25 years ago, no, they, they weren't involved with cities at all except for a few oddballs. Now it's kind of the mainstream. Urban ecology is, um, is where it's happening. So the scientists are getting it. The scientists are ready to collaborate and we need to collaborate with them. You know, we don't, 
we have to be appropriately humble. We can't think that we know everything and we just call the ecologists in when we need them. They need to be a part of this. Also social scientists, also economists. So, but, you know, and then there's this um, idea that I like that the cities can be a part of the solution more than a part of the problem. So, take it or leave it, I think it's, um, it's a nice challenge. Um, biodiversity is more than a nice thing to do. It's, uh, it's more than an ethical or spiritual responsibility. We can do it and justify it for what we get back from it, you know, with a ruthless bottom line approach. We can, we can demonstrate that bio, we, it's in our best economic and business interest to protect biodiversity. You know, trees, for ex urban trees, for example, uh, mitigate the climate. They save us on energy cost. Um, McPherson does that work, right, um, from Arizona. Um, you know, other people are research, you know, so trees do work for us, they save us money. Trees also clean the air. In some small way, they contribute to better um, public health, and that becomes an economic benefit. Public health increases, hospital and uh, care costs go down, the city has a more robust uh, economy because of trees, in part, anyway. So it's all part of the solution, and that kind of thinking is important. But we can't just preach like I'm doing today. We need numbers. Um, and some of these we can make, and some of these we'll, we'll get in collaboration with scientists. Involve school children. Water quality monitoring, for example. We had a great program in Massachusetts um, to monitor water quality for acid rain that used a network of 500 volunteers. People said, I'll do that. Every time it rains, I'll go, I'll go collect a sample and, and put it in a, in a tube and mail it to the lab. It saved tremendous amount of money. You get people involved in the process. Every school could do this in their neighborhood so they know what's happening with the water quality. You know, you get all kinds of benefits from doing this. And I think, you know, most of all is this change in the culture from one, this culture that's being risk averse, that's being afraid to fail, to a culture that thinks it like safe to fail. Let's push the boundaries, let's try to succeed, do it responsibly, but once in a while we're gonna learn something that doesn't work, but even that is in contributing to knowledge uh, through the failure. Uh, transdisciplinarity, I just talked about, you know, we can't do this alone, and we need new ways of, of collaborating with other disciplines and with stakeholders and decision makers. And I think, you know, if I had to sum it up with one phrase, it's the safe to fail idea. You know, it kind of captures a lot of this, that failure is, um, is not always a negative thing, can be positive, and if done responsibly, it can contribute to making cities more sustainable. So with that, I will thank you and um, be happy to take any questions um, or comments that anyone has. Thanks.